Well, in many ways, you guys, here, let's move this. Uh, Bible study interpretation or Bible study methods. In, you know, we've done a couple of classes together here the last year or so. This probably is the most important. Because more often than not, what I get from people, uh, and those of you at church can attest to this, that many people are really, I don't want to say scared of the Bible, um, but the Bible's intimidating. And the Bible's intimidating because it's big, right? And there's 66 books spanning how many dozens of authors, uh, spanning thousands of years. And there's passages in there that look like they're bizarre, maybe violent, aggressive, and offensive maybe to our modern sensibilities. And so we don't, when we approach Scripture, we, we come with a little bit of a, oh gosh, where, where do you begin? What do you do? How, how do you interpret this thing? And more often than not, do you know what people do? They don't. And so they just leave the, they leave, they leave the Bible on the shelf. Uh, it, it, it looks really beautiful. We maybe carry it around with us and take it to church, but it, the spine is perfectly intact because it's a, little bit, it's a little bit intimidating, especially because you think, oh gosh, well, I go to church and maybe um, the, the lady or the gentleman who's up preaching and teaching on Sunday, they seem to know the book so well. I don't, I don't know what they know. Therefore, I, I don't have the skill set or the ability not only to get into the Bible and interpret it, but, but to share the message of the Bible because I'm not educated like that person. Which, by the way, do you know what that is? It's just another form of what we would call works righteousness, what, which would be the opposite of the gospel, right? The, the gospel message is that the righteousness of Jesus comes down to us and saves us. We do not ascend to heaven by our qualifications, by our, the letters after our first name, whether you have a doctorate or whether you have a PhD or, PhD or whether you have a master's, whether you're an REV, a Rev, or wh- whatever. We... Th- Intellectual works righteousness is that I don't have the knowledge, therefore I'm not close to God, whereas look at this guy up there on Sundays or here on Tuesdays, he's closer to God because he knows. That's not Christianity. That's a, that's, well, but most people do think that. Because I hear, you won't, I, if I had a nickel, we've spent the war years together, Nancy and Russ, how many times if you had a nickel every time you heard that? Um, and many times I hear it even from my wife, Right? You know, I, I just don't have the, the I don't know what the, to, the sensibility or the education or the prowess to, in, to interpret the Bible because it's very complicated. And so you leave it to a few intellectual, you know, academics. It's the worst thing you could possibly believe because, um, just really quick, when in the 16th century when Martin Luther, one of the things he did after he was condemned as a heretic, basically for standing up for the gospel, <laughs> is that he was exiled into a castle because the, the prince that was protecting him, Prince Frederick, had to hide him because he had a death sentence on his head. And so an imperial ban. And so what Luther did in that, those, that interim, which was a little, over, little bit over a year, is that he translated the New Testament in, from Greek, which is the original language of the, of the New Testament, Greek. He translated it into German. And it's the first time that people, plus this coincided with the advent of the printing press, so people now, bang, had the Bible in their hands for the first time, and they could read it in, the orig- in their tongue. They could read it in their language and begin to digest and begin to understand that. That was, that was new. Because think, for the first 1,600 years of Christianity, in essence, after the Bible was translated into Latin, from Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek into Latin, which is called the Vulgate translation, done by a wonderful, <laughs> very strange church father named St. Jerome. If you didn't know Latin, you're not going to know anything about the Bible. And so what do you do? You have to rely on your experts. You have to rely on your, your priests and your professors, and they have to give you the Bible and explain it to you. Luther's goal was to make sure every Christian had the Word of God. And here's one of his famous quotes. He says, one average, ordinary, normal, pew-sitting Christian with his or her Bible is way more powerful and trustworthy than a thousand popes and a thousand church councils and a thousand church assemblies without it. So this is what he postulated. There's a priesthood of all believers that all Christians are called to be pastors, priests. That is, interpreters and proclaimers of the word. But if you can't get into this and interpret it, 
makes it very difficult to proclaim it. I mean, in some sense, it makes it a little bit more difficult, especially in our skeptical modern age where people come and they ask questions about the Bible and where did it come from and what do you say, what does this passage mean? And you, as a lover of Jesus, which I trust you all are, as a lover of Jesus, and someone comes to you with a question and your response is, I don't know. You know, it doesn't look like God's word or God's ways or knowing God seems very important to you. And to someone who's exploring whether or not they want to come to faith in Christianity, and you're a lover of God, and it doesn't look like you really care to know God more, it doesn't look like you love God the way you say you love God. And so it's a very unattractive witness. It's not winsome, right? It doesn't mean you have to know the, the iambic pentameter of every, you know, of Psalms and the inclusios and all this stuff. But it does mean we should have a basic, um, not rudimentary, but a basic skill set with which we could take and understand and interpret every passage in Scripture. By the time we're done in the next seven weeks, you will have that skill set. You'll be able to do that. Uh, and it's, and it's, this is why this is probably the most important class you've probably ever sat in. Because we're not dealing with a textbook. You're not dealing with uh, just another a book of poems or wonderful narrative or a history book, which is a lot of people, when I was at PLU, my professor, he said, we're going to study the Bible not as God's word, but as a good genre of history, which it is. There is history in the Bible. I'm not saying that. But over and above all that, we, inter- we hold this as the true word of God, right? That comes, from God, that comes from God's mouth, so to speak. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what it means to be the Bible's divinely inspired. Any questions before we dive in? So I want to dispel everyone's fears usually because, and the reason I said I hear it a lot, we're going to dispel that right away. And by the time we're done, you are going to be fit to be a proclaimer, so much so that if your preacher, your pastor comes to you on Sunday and says, I'd love for you to stand up and give the message on Luke 7, uh, 15 to 20 minutes, you should be able to say, I, sir, easy, easy, easy does it. I'll be able to do it. Now, you may have the whole fear of public speaking, you know, but that's a whole other different thing. Um, I was listening to Jerry, you know, Jerry Seinfeld. He said, he said uh, the, number, the number one fear people have in life is public speaking. That's one survey said that's the number one fear people have. Number two is death, which he says, which he says that means if you're at a funeral, you'd rather be in the casket than in the pulpit. <laughs> Briefly now, briefly now, and we'll get into translations really quickly. Where did our Bible come from? That's a common one that I get. How many of you have received that question before? Where did we get our Bible from? And you know, it, it, sort of the cultural misnomer is that, well, it was, a, it was a bunch of guys who wanted to consolidate power, and they chose some writings and excluded others so that they could establish their power base and be in control, and that's sort of the history of how the Bible became the Bible. That's not true, historically. It's, it's truly specious historical work to say that. So where, where did the Bible come from? Yes, is it true that the New Testament canon, what do we, what we mean by canon, it comes from the Greek word kanon, which means ruler standard. So that's what we call the Bible, the canon. So what does it mean? The Bible is the rule and standard for every Christian's belief, how they live, how they think, for ethics, for morals, for everything. The Bible, another word for the Bible is the canon. It's the rule and the standard, the sole norm. We say, one of the definitions is of Scripture, it's the sole norm. What does soul mean? It's the only one. The sole norm in matters of faith and life. It comes before your experience. It comes before your feelings. It comes before what the culture says. It comes before any understanding you have of anything else. Scripture is your sole norm in matters of faith and life. It comes before everything. That's what it means by canon. So the the Old Testament canon, which we know as the Old Testament, which some people, they don't want to call it the Old Testament. They'll say the Hebrew Bible or the First Testament, to which my professor Gerhard Ferdy of blessed memory said, why is it wrong to call the Old Testament the Old Testament? He says, is there something wrong with being old? Huh? He goes, maybe we should call it the Senior Testament. Uh, the Old Testament canon, you guys, was established firmly, uh, Old Testament in AD 91. It's called the Council of Jamnia. 
8091. That's where you have your 39 books of the Old Testament, which is what you have in your Bible right now. The canon of the New Testament was closed 325 at the Council of Nicaea. Now, when you look at those numbers, you'll say, that's about 300 years after Jesus. That's a long time. So, what's the reasoning for that? The reasoning for it is because up until 325, Christianity was illegal and, and so never had like an official like pro- proclamation or, or meeting which says these books and none other. Because although the church was organized, it's, it wasn't centrally organized. And so there were pockets of Christians all over the Mediterranean world from 30 AD to 325 AD. Rodney Stark, great book, wrote the book, The Rise of Christianity, predicted it. On the day of Pentecost, there were 10,000 Christians, maybe less. He says, by the year 250, there were 34 million. We've never seen a movement like that ever before. Not the explosion of Apple or Microsoft or some great political movement that takes off. We have never seen a movement like that of conversion, of disciples making disciples that make disciples that make disciples that make disciples. This is why it's important for us to study those first couple of centuries of Christianity because we've never seen anything like it. Utterly changed the entire Roman world. Pagan shrines and temples, you guys, that had been established for thousands of years within in the span of a century, two centuries were emptied because everyone was converting to Christianity. People think that when Constantine converted to Christianity, everyone became a Christian. The truth of the history is the fact that everyone was already converted to Christianity and Constantine wanted to back the winning horse. So, so Christianity was exploding throughout the Roman world. And it was all strata. Stark says it's from all strata of people, from people who were lower class, people with the, with, with, uh, their, their, that, that did not have rights, like slaves and females. It, it was them, but it was also into the upper crest too. What did Paul say? When you were called by the gospel of 1 Corinthians, not many of you were wise, which means some of them were. Not many of you were of high status, which means some of them were. Look at the end of Philippians 4. It says there were, greet the Christians, Paul says, who are in the emperor's household, which means that there have been Christians converted that are already in the family of, G- of Caesar at the time, of the emperor. So Christianity was crossing all strata, which is cool. And Stark says the reason why is because the central doctrine of Christianity is the gospel, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that those who believe in him should not perish but have every, everlasting life. Doesn't, didn't mention it's for Jews. Nope, only for Jews. Only for blacks, only for whites, only for Asians, only for Hispanics. Doesn't say that. Only for men, only for women. No, it crosses all genres. For the rich, for the poor, for the educated, for the uneducated. It crossed all genres. Never seen anything like that before, ever. Stunning. So what happened in these 300 years? Well, for the most part, it's not a sexy story. The fact of the matter is, is that the Christians, their New Testament, they basically had a certain number of books that everyone was using throughout the Mediterranean world. And there were a few controversial ones, but for the most part, about 23 out of the 27 books in the New Testament, all the Christians were using from the first century all the way up to the third century. It was basically like blessing. When they solidified the canon in 325, it was basically blessing what the Christians were already using in their Bible. They didn't establish the Bible here. They just gave a blessing to what they were already using for their scripture. And it's interesting, by the close of the first century, Luke's gospel is being viewed as scripture. The apostle Paul quotes that. Paul's writings are used as scripture. Peter says that in 2 Peter, where he says, Paul, some people interpret Paul's writings and they, they mess it up as they do other scripture, Peter says. So that means that they were viewing these original writings of the apostles as scripture right from jump. And so, in essence, by the close of the first century, all the books that you have in your New Testament were already written. So what were some criteria for including books in the New Testament that the early Christians in the first century, in the second century, why did they view these books as, as uh, authoritative, as scriptural? Well, number one, they were apostolic. That's important. What does that mean? Anyone want to take a stab? It goes back to one of these guys. They were apostolic. Why is that important? They were there. They saw it. 
They witnessed it. They walked with him. They talked with him. They ate with him. They saw him die. They saw him rise again. They saw his resurrected body. They touched his resurrected body. They saw his resurrected body eat. They heard what he said, that he is the way, the truth, and life. Any th- Number one criteria for Scripture is that it's apostolic. So look at your Gospels. Now, you have four Gospels, right? How many of them by name are apostolic? Two, right? Mark and Luke were not original eyewitnesses. Matthew and John were. And as a matter of fact, John is the only Gospel that claims to be an eyewitness. Matthew never says, I'm Matthew. I was there. John does. He says he was there. John 21. What what does it say at the end of John 21? This is the disciple who wrote these things down, and we know that his testimony is true. However, do you know what church tradition? A man named Papias of Hierapolis. Anyone ever heard of Papias before? Oh, good. Okay, a couple. So, when you, when, when, you, when you young gals, when you grow up and get married and you have kids, consider Papias as a name for your firstborn son. It's a beautiful name. Or Polycarp, even better, right? Uh, uh, Polycarp was roughly contemporaneous with this guy, Papias. He wrote right around the year, they think like 105, maybe 110. And he had experiences or was privy to talking to some of the original eyewitnesses and most of the apprentices of the eyewitnesses. Who would be an apprentice of an eyewitness? Well, he's in Scripture, but like Timothy. And do you know what Papias said about the Gospel of Mark? Mark was Peter's interpreter, he says, at the, in the, at the turn, right around this time. That means that all of Mark's Gospel was taken from the preaching of Peter. So, in essence, you could call it the Gospel of Peter. And it, not only Papia says this, Irenaeus says this, which makes the Gospel of Mark quite, what? Apostolic. Quite apostolic. Especially it's from the chief apostle, or the, you know, the, however you want to define chief, but the chief apostle. What about Luke? What, is, what does Irenaeus tell us about Luke? St. Irenaeus, who's about 180 AD, says that Luke was a traveling companion of Paul which makes the Gospel of Luke now quite apostolic. And what does Luke say in the very first chapter of his Gospel? I went around what? And I received from who? The eyewitnesses, he says. I went around around and interviewed the eyewitnesses and servants of the Word, which makes Luke's Gospel apostolic. And so you could go through the entire New Testament. You could go through the letters of Paul, 13 letters of Paul. Some of those are disputed, but we're not going to get into that tonight. That Paul, an apostle... It's apostolic, right? You could get into First, Second Peter, apostolic. That's Peter. Peter even talks about in those letters that how he, how he was there at the transfiguration. How about First, Second, and Third John? Apostolic. Go read First John and then go read the Gospel of John's first chapter. Have you ever done that before? They read almost alike. What does he say in 1 John? That which was from the beginning. That's what we handled with our hands that we, that we touched, with, that we saw. We saw this word of life. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It's almost exactly the same. So it's probably the same author. It's John. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, apostolic. Now you get into Hebrews, maybe Revelation, Titus, apostolic. That's Paul. 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, um, Jude, Possibly a brother. Most of these are apostolic. The ones that were controversial were like Hebrews and Revelation. Some churches in the first, second, third century used Hebrews and Revelation. Some didn't. And so those were the ones that were controversial. But for the most part, how many of you around like Easter time and around Christmas time? Do you ever watch the History Channel? Am I boring you guys? Are you guys bored? Okay. Um, I'm, tr- trust me. I know many people don't think so, but I'm a super insecure speaker. And so... Um, if I feel like we're not engaged or we're getting bored, if ever I'm getting bored, 30 seconds of boring is 30 seconds too long. So if, if you ever feel we're getting bored, we'll pray and we'll get out of here because I don't want to waste your time and I certainly don't want to waste my time, okay? So um, do you ever watch the History Channel around like Easter or Christmas and they have these specials called Lost Books of the Bible? Do you ever see this? You can go through the grocery store line and you'll see like Life Magazine, Jesus, and the Lost Books of the Bible. It's bull crap. So here, let me give you a framework. This is important. At the turn of the first century, 
how many gospels had been written on the life of Jesus at the turn of the first century. So Jesus lived, died. This is the considered scholarly, scholarly date, right around AD 30. Paul writes roughly from about 48 to 65. You have the gospels shortly thereafter. And then the turn of the, turn, turn to the second century is right around AD 100. By AD 100, most people think John's gospel was written in 90, AD 90. How many gospels was the church or the Christians in possession of at the turn of the first century to the second century? Four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. That's all they had. About a 75 years to 100 years after that, there started to pop up a proliferation of these other gospels called Gnostic gospels. Most notably, the gospel of Thomas. Have you heard this one before? Or the gospel of Peter, or the gospel of Mary, or the gospel of Judas. And these were called, these were written by early Christian heretics, false teachers called the Gnostics. G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S. Gnostics comes from the Greek word gnosis, special knowledge. And what they would do is they would have a special knowledge, like a vision or a dream. And in my dream, I met James, the brother of John, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And in my dream, this is this is 150 years after Jesus or 120 years after Jesus' life. I met him and he told me to write something down. And so I wrote it down and I called it the Gospel of Thomas. That's where that stuff comes from. Doesn't come from eyewitness accounts. Doesn't come. So what would those Gospels lack? That. That. And so don't let these stupid channels scare you into thinking there were other Gospels. And then in 325, there was a group of, of powerful men that went, we're going to exclude this because we're anti this, we're anti that, and we're going to establish our hierarchy. It's bull crap. It's all garbage. It's terrible history. And people believe it because they read Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code, which there's a chapter in that which directly talks about everything that I'm talking about right now and purports that this was a big conspiracy where they established the Bible in 325 to establish power. It's garbage. All garbage. And I'm, I'm just, well, I'm not shocked, but I'm surprised that, you know, these, these magazines that want to talk about or these shows on the History Channel talk about lost books of the Bible, you get none of that. Why? Because there's nothing entertaining about, well, yeah, I guess the Bible that we have was the Bible that comes from the original eyewitnesses and the apostles and you're kind of stuck with that one. There's nothing like cool or conspiratorial about that. It's just, I guess it's just traditional Orthodox Christianity, you know? So, any questions on this stuff? Yes. You do. You have, a letter, you have a letter of James in the Bible. So the, the book of James, which is Jesus' little brother. <laughs> but don't be surprised that not everyone was... See, this is where you've got to put first century goggles on here. Don't be surprised that not everyone was writing all the time back then. Literacy in Israel was 6%. Good. Catherine Hetzer's done a, a wonderful study on literacy in, in, uh, in Israel in the first century. Literacy was around 6%. So that means 94% of the population could not read, could not write. They could, so what, what, what could they do? How do you learn? Here, my educator's in here. Your students can't read, your students can't write. They have some rudimentary skills. Maybe they could write their name or something like that. But for the most part, can't read, can't write. Educators, how do you teach them? Or Correct. Yes. Because you can't teach them how to read and write because most of the educators didn't know how to read or write. And so you teach them orally. And you teach them through memorization. And that's why you have Jesus talking like this. I am the vine, you are the branches. And where does he teach that? In a garden with vines and branches? Where does he teach, I am the bread of life? He who believes me will never go hungry again. After he, after he feeds them, after he feeds the 5,000 with bread, two lo five loaves and two fish. So do you see the imagery? And also, most scholars think that Jesus tailored his teaching so as to be memorizable. Like the... The chief New Testament scholar, one of the biggest New Testament scholars in the world today, Richard Bauckham, 
And this is the scholarly consensus that Jesus Christ taught intentionally so that his teaching could be memorized. So give, give me an example. It's really easy. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar. Easy, right? Easy to memorize. Easy to memorize. Um, do unto others as you would have done unto you. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Do you see they're, they're, they're memor- they're, it's memorizable, that stuff? Huh? Right, and he did that on purpose. And so what the early Christians did, and you've heard me talk about 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 7, which is the earliest piece of New Testament literature that we have because 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 7, written by the Apostle Paul, written probably in the year 55, predates the Apostle Paul and goes back to within probably six months to a year of the resurrection event itself. Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 7? For I handed unto you, he says to you Corinthians, what I received as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised from the dead on the third day, that he appeared to Cephas, huh? then he appeared to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters of one time, though most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then he appeared to all the apostles, and then last of all, Paul says, he appeared to me as to one untimely born. That rhythm in the first, don't forget this, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 7. I could talk about this that every, every day, 1 Corinthians 15, because the reading in the Greek goes, it would read in the Greek, if you knew Greek, it would read like this. Uh, da, 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 A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. It's meant to be memorized. It's, a, it's rabbinic transmission. We know that. Whenever you read any literature, when rabbis would transmit to their students, it, would, it, it has that Greek word, hoti, that he appeared, then he appeared, that he appeared, that Greek word. There's rhythm to it. And so most scholars date that early primitive Christian belief statement about the resurrection. James D.G. Dunn, who's no evangelical, he just passed away in 2019, of Durham University. Dunn says, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 7, if Paul wrote it in 55 AD, he says, that creed began to be formulated and put into practice the week after the first Easter Sunday. It's the earliest confession of faith of our brothers, of our ancient brothers and sisters in the faith that were the original eyewitnesses. It's the first one. And by the way, those creeds, you've heard me say this, they're all over the New Testament. There's about a dozen of them that are included in the New Testament. And you know what scholars are starting to do? In your Bible, you could look this up later, don't do it now. Here's another one, Philippians 2, 5 to 11. You could open up your Bible to Philippians 2, and you know what scholars are starting to do? To indent them, right? So it's not a part of like Paul's original paragraph. They'll indent it to show you that Paul's quoting here. This isn't Paul's words. He's quoting a creed that predates Paul. For, if you look at your Bible, you'll see it, Philippians 2, 5 to 11, that Christ being in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped. Let's see if my ESV does it here. I'll be quick. Hold on, don't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, my ESV doesn't right here, but I bet most Bibles, you know what I'm talking about, Doc. Most Bibles that I, that I have, they indented to show a quote. Romans 10.9 is another one. Famous verse. What's Romans 10.9? That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's another creed. Those are all over, all over. And then you have in Acts, you have when Peter preaches or when Paul preaches. These are called the, the, the Acts sermon summaries. Most people think that the sermons of Peter and the sermons of Paul when Luke collected those, were early creeds also of the primitive Christian community that could not read or write. So they would memorize these, and then they'd tell them to one another, and they'd memorize the sayings, you know, and they'd memorize these events. Memorization was far more important back then. People say, how could you memorize every word that Jesus, Jesus said? I mean, memorization was far more important back then than it is, than it is now. I, this is one of the reasons we're biblically lazy, is because you don't need to memorize anymore because you could just say... Google, talk to Google. Where, where, where does it say if you believe with your mouth, that, it, it confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised then you will be saved? Oh, Romans 10, 9. You don't, I wish we were, I wish we were more illiterate. <laughs> you know, that we would be forced back into the basics because that illiteracy forced them back into the basics, made them more informed, made them more winsome, made their testimony more powerful and made the spread of Christianity all the more mul- multiplicative because they were memorizing. And, it, and, and by the way, 
And when you're sharing the gospel with someone and it comes from here rather than, hold on a second. <laughs> comes from here, far more powerful. Far more powerful. You could say, you know, uh, uh, talking to someone who's experienced the death of a loved one. Hey, it's okay. It's okay to grieve. But we don't grieve as those who have no hope. 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Because why? Because we believe Jesus died and rose again. And because Jesus died and rose again, we know that God will come and bring with the, bring, bring, have Jesus come and bring those who have fallen asleep in Jesus to be with Jesus. Right? I go to prepare a place for you, Jesus says. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will certainly come and get you so that where I am, you may be also. When that comes from here rather than just from a book, it's infinitely better. Infinitely better. Martin Luther, you know what he says? The biggest problem with the Bible? What well, he said, Luther would have been a, you know, a totally inerrant, you know, Bible's word of God. So he's not, he's not capping on the Bible, of course. But you know what he is saying? The biggest problem with the Bible is that it had to be written. Hmm? It's much better when it comes out orally like this. Much better. You know, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How about this? God so loved the world that he gave his only son for you. And if you trust in him and you believe in him, you who walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you have eternal life with Jesus. So get your doggone chin up because the victory is Jesus Christ. That sounds better, isn't it, than just reading a verse? Right? Because the Bible demands to be proclaimed. So to interpret and to proclaim. So we're getting there. Where did we get our... Let's go to the New Testament. So uh, how did we get these writings to put our Bible together? Here's something cool. So I'm going to share some stats with you. This is really cool. Super cool. I expect oohs and ahs. So, uh, so ancient manuscripts, archaeologically, we've been, we, we've been discovering ancient manuscripts from the, Greek, the, the Greco-Roman world for decades, right? Centuries. D do you know where we're getting most of the ancient manuscripts from? Britain. Do you want to know Why? Because guess who owned Egypt? The, the main Christian library back then, there were two big intellectual centers of Christianity in the first three centuries. One was in Antioch, which is in Syria. It was called the Antiochian School. And then there was a school in Alexandria, which is in Egypt. That's probably where the autographs went, the original copies of the New Test, the original New Testament. And when, unfortunately, all those got burned and ransacked in the Muslim conquest of those areas, and they just burned all the Christian scripture they could find. And so we lost a lot of the stuff that was in the Alexandrian school. Um, but the British, where did they colonize? Egypt. And then when they took everything back to Britain, they took all these manuscripts with them. So all these ancient manuscripts from the Middle East are like in the Rylands Library in London. Isn't that weird? And so they're rediscovering it. There's actually a group of scholars, Daniel Wallace of Dallas Theological Seminary is one of them. He's, this would be worth donating your money to, is he's going through with a team of scholars and technology that's like $100,000 worth of technology, and they're going to these different libraries, and they're digitalizing all the ancient Christian manuscripts right now. It's awesome. And but before we leave, I'll, I have his manuscripts. You could get this app on your phone so you could look at the doggone original manuscripts. So let me give you an example. So probably the most famous uh, Greek literature, I don't know, in and around the hundreds of years, maybe a thousand years before, a thousand years after, a couple hundred years after Jesus, the most famous one is probably Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. For the average Greco-Roman author, how many, how, do, how many manuscripts have we found archaeologically? For the average one, let's say if, you know, Dan started to write poems or stories, how many manuscripts do we have? That's the average. Homer, though, because he was so popular, and when you're popular, what do people do when you have something that's popular? Copy, copy, copy. How many manuscripts have we found from Homer? 1,800. Greek manuscripts. That's a lot when the average is seven. Do you know how many, in the first 300 years of Christianity, do you know how many Greek manuscripts we've uncovered? 6,000. Almost quadruple that of the most popular Greek author in the ancient Greco-Roman world, Homer. 
which means, you guys, that this stuff was being copied and copied and copied and copied and copied. And you're saying, well, that's why I don't trust it. Because Carolyn writes a co copies the original, then Susan copies Carolyn, then Mike Adams copies Susan, and then Jerry copies Mike Adams, and then Marv copies Jerry, and then Nancy copies Marv, Russ copy. You get the idea, right? We know from copying it didn't work that way. <laughs> if Carolyn was the original, let's say Karen, Carolyn had the original Gospel of John and she copies it. She tells Susan about it. Susan's gonna, Susan wants a copy. She, she, uh, she would copy, if you're the original, she would copy you, yours. And then if she told Mike about it, Mike wanted to make a copy, he would go to Carolyn's and copy Carolyn's. And then Jerry would go to Carolyn's, and Marv would go to Carolyn's, and Russ would go to Carolyn. You didn't copy the copy, the copy, the copy, the copy. And we know, how do we know that? It's because we found manuscripts that date into the 200s from Christ, the Christian New Testament, and then manuscripts in the 400s from the Christian New Testament, one from Jerusalem, one from Rome, and they read exactly the same. Which means that they were consistently going back to the original, and that's why... Do you know the original manuscripts are the, like, let's say I'm John, I wrote John. That's called the auto, those are called the autographs, the originals, right? Now, <laughs> if those are written on paper, how, here, if they're translated or copied that much, imagine you're turning those papyrus pages. Hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of times, what happened to that papyrus? You could go look at my grandma's Bible when I was a kid, and that was just one that she read, she read and looked at for 40, 40 years, and it looked like it had gone through the Holocaust. You know, it, it, was, uh, it was emaciated. <laughs> it was beat up, right? It looked like it just went through suffering. Well, imagine the original manuscripts of the Gospels, the Gospels and Paul's letters, and they get turned, and this is papyrus, not new pages like we have. It just dissolved. Or it was burned in Alexandria. It just dissolved. The blessing of having all those manuscripts? Think about it this way. So, Muhammad gets a revelation in the 7th century, the 6th century, 600s, and writes the Quran. But then there's two competing copies that are made of the Quran. They lose the original. Well, the guy who was in charge says, I like this one better than this one, and so he burns this one, and so there's only one remaining, and so there's one copy of a copy that becomes the, the, the that gets manufactured out to every everyone. How, well, how do you know you have the original? You don't. You don't. With the New Testament, you made a copy, you made a copy, you made a copy, you made a copy. There's thousands of competing copies, which is what you want, because now you can compare and contrast, and it's easy to get back to the original now. And so we've discovered not just 6,000 in Greek, Greek manuscripts, not just 6,000 Greek manuscripts. Add in Latin. Add in Coptic. Add in Georgian, a couple other languages. Total New Testament manuscripts for the first couple hundred years of Christianity are currently at 27,000. It's, to quote Daniel Wallace, Mike, it's an embarrassment of riches. We have an, it's, it's, we're embarrassingly rich with manuscripts, which enables you to get back to the original because you have so many copies of the original. If it would have been like the, the history of Islam and you just have this one copy and he burns the other two, you're never getting back to the original. It's gone forever. Gone forever. But because we have all these. So th about 25 years ago, discovered a manuscript in the Rylands Library. It's called Papyrus 52, P52. Have you heard me talk about this before? P52 is from John chapter 18. And they date it back to the year 100, between 100 and 120. Ooh, John's gospel was written in 90 to 95. You, you're reading a, probably a copy of the original. I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy. Do you know the best surviving copy uh, you have of, 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 of Buddha's writings or the Bhagavad Gita, well, specifically Buddhism, is 900 years later? How about this, the life of Alexander the Great? Best manuscripts we have that we have for Alexander the Great, 300 years after his death. You guys, we have manuscripts within 10, 15 years. And we have material in 1 Corinthians 15 that goes back to within months 
after the resurrection, it's embarrassingly rich and good. I mean, the, with archaeology and, and historical study, the Bible has never been more reliable historically, scientifically, than it is right now because we're discovering more. So when people say, well, just believe the Bible and don't ask questions. See, like in our church, we're just the opposite. We say, yes, believe the Bible, but research and ask as many questions as possible. That's why Steve Jobs, who was raised in the Lutheran church, quit Christian, denied Christianity, became an unbeliever. You know that, right? He went to his pastor, said, I have some questions. Can you explain this? He goes, don't ask questions, just take it on faith. And he says, stupid religion, I'm done with it forever. And I don't blame him because he had a sucky pastor who didn't encourage him to, a- to ask questions like that. Guys, we've never been in a place where Scripture, the witness and testimony of Scripture, is more reliable than we have right now. It's absolutely insane. The Bible, my teacher at seminary, Craig Kester, said the Bible you hold in your hand. So for instance, um, in the 16th century, when they translated uh, King James and even the stuff Martin Luther was using, do you know the manuscripts they were using for translation from Greek into, into German? We're from the 1400s. Just FYI, that's a long ways away from Jesus, AD 30. But because of science and archaeology, we're now discovering manuscripts from like 110, (laughs) the 200s. We're getting, we're way closer. So your newer translations, like what I use, ESV or NIV or what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you like, Doc? Uh, Even the old RSV. Holman's good. There's tons of good translations out there. I just, I know some people like the Living Bible or the Living Translation, which is fine, but that's not a translation from the original Greek. It's a paraphrase in English. So I want the word-for-word translation from the original Greek, which is very difficult to do. Because like um, your average Greek New Testament has about, th- about 130,000 words. I think that's correct. And your average English New Testament has 180,000 words. Why? Because, how about this one? Why does that happen? Because in Greek, agiasteto, what does that mean? Uh, uh, be made holy. Well, they could say it in one word, but in, we, we, we need three words to say what they said in one word. Does that make sense? So sometimes the English, if there's more words needed, that's why, that's why that happens. Um, but the reliability of Scripture right now is just, we're in a dynamite place. Um, we got about 10 minutes. Any questions on that? I just wanted to establish when you start to go into this book, you're going into it. And it's not just believe it because it's God's word. Yes, I would say that as a follower of Jesus Christ, of course. But I'm saying there's reason behind this. There's science behind this. There's logic behind this. And there's, a, this is Charmy we were talking about. There's, there's apologetic witness that you can make a strong, cogent defense for the authenticity and the reliability of this book. Not just go believe it because you should, and I'm your mom, and it's God's word, and if you question it, you're going to hell. You know, um, I think those people who say that are going to hell. um, Because I think we need to be encouraging Christians to think more, not less. Ask questions more, not less. Yes, Doc? NIV. Like Mike Adams and I say, I, at my house, I have about, I go back to the original languages because that's why I'm so grateful that you're sitting in a seminary and an institution that values the original languages, especially with people that are going to teach, which personally, you want my personal opinion? Don't get intimidated. I think every Christian that sits in a pew and worships God, claims Jesus as Savior, should have some rudimentary understanding of Greek and Hebrew. It's the original language of our word. I'm not saying you've got to be an expert. I'm saying, but you should have some rudimentary knowledge of that. And that's maybe why, perhaps at my church, we're going to start maybe doing some Greek and Hebrew study, if you're interested. So, <laughs> he kind of got it. But I said, no, I like a lot about it. 
because I like the way he translated some words. Uh, when he translated, uh, uh, like newborn babes, uh, uh, desire the sincere mouth of the word. Well, that's good, you know, King James. But the uh, epithetio is really, it's not about desiring mother's mouth. It, a baby doesn't desire mother's mouth. A baby craves mother's mouth. That's what a baby does, and so they translated that word in and I did pray. But I said, thank you for that. And he goes, I don't even remember doing that. But I said, no, no, you did. But thank you for that, because it's far better translation. But that's what's known as a dynamic equivalent. Mm -hmm. It's and not I a word for word. Paraphrase like the Living Bible. Uh, the problem with the Living Bible is it's a little too loosey-goosey, where the NIV is a pretty good translation. All the international students, interestingly enough, want to read the NIV. International students, students from Korea, because it sounds the most like English. And so they're, they're using a dynamic equivalent, not as much word for word, but what is the intent of the passage? They're trying to create understanding. I had another professor, Dr. Wayne House. He's a word to word guy. So, and you kind of need so them both. You need them both. So that's why Doc and I will have, in my house, I'll have an ESV, word for word. Yeah. I'll have an NIV, dynamic equivalency. Yeah, exactly. um, I'll have uh, New King James. I mean, there's all sorts of faithful translations, but it's good to have a bunch of translations if you don't know the original language. That's what I would say. Have a bunch of them. You, there's even like Bibles, parallel Bibles, where you could have a passage and it'll have the NIV translation, ESV translation. You, you could have all those next to each other and you could look at... Let me give you an example and I, where NIV... One part where I don't, because I have an NIV, and I, it's what I use on Sunday. Um, but get this. Okay, so Jesus. We love Jesus, and Jesus is sweeter than honey, which he is. And he would never say anything coarse or disrespectful to his mom. So, in John chapter 2, his first miracle, what happens at the wedding? They're at a wedding, and it's one of the worst things that could happen. You guys who are planners, you Marthas, who like to have everything perfect, and I run into you Marthas, especially when I have to do weddings, and you're a pain in the neck because, you know, every chair has to be situated here, and the flowers have to be here. Well, that's how men and women are with weddings, mostly you gals, but that's the guys too. And they run out of wine, which would have been like... <laughs> Would have been like running out of wine at a wedding today. Uh, <laughs> and, and so Mary, Jesus' mom, comes to him and he says, she says, they've run out of wine. And he says, uh, this is NIV, he says, dear woman, what is this to me? My hour is not yet come. Now, if you go to the original language and look at it, there's no word for dear there. So here's, here's how it sounded in NIV. Dear woman, what is that to me? My hour has not yet come. Is he sweet? Here's how it originally was written. Woman, what's that to me? My hour has not yet come. Ooh, that sounds different, doesn't it? <laughs> You're taking the edge off of Jesus a little bit with the translation. Now, if you have ESV and you have NIV, there you get to see the disparity, right? So it's good. Um, let me share one more thing about manuscripts. Let's say we didn't have, let's say archaeologically we never found one. We have 27,000. Let's say we had zero. Zero manuscripts. That'd be a problem, right? No. Because guys like Papias, guys like Irenaeus, guys like Jerome, all these early Christian church writers, you can construct, in the first 300 years of Christianity, you can construct the entire New Testament strictly just from their writings too without the manuscripts. Isn't that crazy? Because they quote the Bible, all, they quote the New Testament all over the place. You could construct it just from their writings alone. By the way, let me tell you something really cool. It's a total sidebar. P52, that manuscript, the Gospel of John, it's Codex. You may say, is that like a camera, like Kodak? Uh, it's, no. Codex, it's about the size of a credit card, and, and John, the, the language of John's gospel, it's on the front and the back of it, which meant that the Christians were using what? Like a book, which would have been rare at that time because most everyone, how did they have their sacred writings? 
in a scroll. Luke 4, when Jesus goes to his home synagogue, they unrolled the scroll for him. Christians were in codex, front and back, bound. And there were little sections that were bound. And that's what they would use for their scripture. They didn't have a fully bound Bible like we do, but they'd have little sections. Maybe it's just, maybe it's uh, Luke 24, the resurrection appearances, and they'd have those bound up and it's front and back. And those are the ones they would read. And do you know what those bindings were called? This is really funny. Choirs. Q-U-I-R-E-S, choirs. Just a total side note. Point is, Christians were always on the, on the upper, or, or on the edge of new technology. Now we're looked at as stodgy and old and traditional and boring. But they were always on the edge of the new technology. Same thing with Luther. Translated it into the Bible, into the original language, printing press is going out, pumping like crazy, going out everywhere. What were they utilizing? New technology. So we got to figure out how to baptize new technology today, you know, and not say, oh, technology bad. Well, Christians for thousands of years have been always using it. So you're kind of wrong historically there. So we got to find a way to, to use it and baptize it and make it ours. I got five minutes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's number two? Number two is, um, well, this is, this is the biggie, is, that, is that, it was, that it was apostolic, you know, and that it was connected to the core gospel message would be the second one. So it can't be like, hey, hey, Peter, it's Paul. Uh, did, you, did you want pepperoni on that pizza? <laughs> Love Paul. Like, that wouldn't go in the Bible, even though it's apostolic. You, you get my point? So it has to be connected back to the original eyewitnesses and the core of the gospel has to be the, sub, the subject matter. Make sense? And there's lots of letters of Paul we did not recover. There's a whole other letter to, to the Corinthians that we don't have. Wouldn't that be great if we had that? Paul mentions it. Okay, really quick. The most important part we're saving for the last four minutes. But I did want to give you a foundation of your Bible that you have. I think it's so important when, you're, when your kids or your friends come and ask you about the Bible and they say, well, you know, it was just copied upon, copied upon, copied. You could say, actually, <laughs> you're not right there. You know, that's not, that's not how this went. So James D.G. Dunn wrote a great book called Jesus Remembered. Twin volume, about 1,900 pages. Go read it if you want to. But it's called Jesus Remembered. And his whole thesis is that what you have in your New Testament is merely memories of Jesus, which is true. We think it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, but that's, that's all you have are memories, memories of Jesus. And, so, and then people will say, well, how reliable is memory? Because let's say it's apostolic and Mike was an apostle and he was there. And he's telling you 20 years later, well, how reliable is Mike's memory? Well, most part, eyewitness memories considered not very good. I mean, you could go ask someone that sees a car crash. Was it a red car, blue car? I don't, I don't know. They did a study on, remember the explosion of the space shuttle Challenger? You guys don't remember. 1986, remember? They did a test on how many, one year later, how many of them remembered details about it. And almost one, one guy didn't even remember that he was in the classroom and saw it there. So then people say, very unreliable memory. Judith Redmond, who's an expert in me psychological memory studies, said, there's, a, there's some other caveats, though. Yes, if I see a car crash, it's a flash. I don't know. Uh, there was a car crash. I do know that. I do know Challenger blew up. I do know that. But the details, where I was, what happened. What... Because it wasn't like central in my mind. He says, however, if, if a memory is highly emotional to you, huh, and it's highly irregular, what does that mean? It doesn't happen. It, it, you never saw something like this before, right? And it's a memory that, that undergoes frequent rehearsal by you. You tell it often. It's eyewitness memory is very reliable. Guys, ask me, think of those of us who are married. I was married 14, 14th wedding anniversary this month, Kim and I. Um, yeah, what's the old adage? Uh, have you ever considered divorce? No. Murder? Yes. Divorce? No. Uh, <clears throat> um, was it a highly emotional event for me? Yes. Was it highly unusual? It doesn't happen very often? Yes. 
Um, do we think about it a lot? Yes. Do we rehearse it to each other? Yes. I could remember every dog on detail, you guys. I remember uniform I was wearing. I remember what she was wearing. I remember her hair. I remember where we stood. I remember what was said. Like verbatim, right? Well, look at the gospel. Super important emotional event, Jesus' resurrection. Highly unusual. Yeah, never happened before. <laughs> Someone rises from the dead. Rehearse it frequently, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the eyewitness memory is probably pretty reliable. See? Anyway, these principles, I, the sheet I gave you, I'm going to go through them in one minute. We're going to pick up on this next week. But I do want to just cruise through it with you. I want to do the first principle with you, and then we'll do the next 12 next week. Are you cool with that? Because, guys, remember I said this is the most important class? Establishing the reliability is super important. It's not half as important as this stuff. Now it's reliable. How do you read it and interpret it? The first principle, really quick, just give me a couple minutes. Jesus Christ is the center of Scripture. That's your first operating, this is called a hermeneutic. Your first biblical hermeneutic, your first interpretive principle is that Jesus Christ is the center of all Scripture. Every letter, every sentence, every verse, every book, Jesus Christ is the center of it. And do you know who said that about the Bible? Jesus Christ did. Remember what he said to the, in Luke 24? Everything that was written about me in the law and in the prophets and the Psalms had to come true. Then he opened their minds so they could understand everything written about him in the scriptures. Jesus said, everything is about me. Furthermore, Jesus Christ in John 1 is called what? In the beginning was the? Word. Yes. Where do you think you got your word from? You got your word that you're holding in your hand? From the word. <laughs> so of course, the word of God comes from the word of God incarnate, who is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the midpoint. And what if you had to take Jesus and narrow it down to what is the midpoint with him? What's the most important thing about Jesus' life is what? His death and his resurrection. That's the ripe fruit. That is your first operating lens with which to view everything in the Bible through the lens of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. That's the context for everything. I don't care if you're looking in the Exodus at Moses. This is Martin Luther now. And he's exactly right on this. I don't care if you're reading Ecclesiastes. I don't care if you're reading Judges, <laughs> which we did in our church, which is just like watching like some sort of perverted Netflix series, <laughs> except worse. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's unreal. Jesus Christ's death and resurrection is the lens through which you view everything. The words of Jesus, Jesus Christ's death and resurrection is the lens through which you look at everything. How about this? So I had a question today. Um, when Jesus Christ uh, said, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and for this you fulfill the law and the prophets. So can we do that? Well, uh, Jesus Christ's death and resurrection would say you couldn't. <laughs> Why not? Because if he had to die and rise again for us, while we were dead in our sins and trespasses, Paul says, Jesus Christ died for, Romans says that. Um, while we were helpless, Paul says, when we were dead, Ephesians 2 says, Christ died to save us. If we could do it, then what is he doing on the cross? That's the, that's the principle. If we were able to fulfill the law, what is Jesus Christ doing on the cross? If, if he could, he wouldn't be there. That's Karl Barth, the famous 20th century theologian. He says, the fact that he's on the cross is the indictment and the pronouncement of our guilt. You can't do it because he's there. If you could do it, he wouldn't be there. So the mere fact that he came and he died and died for us means that you were absolutely a corpse in terms of doing anything for your salvation. The Bible says we were dead. What, a corpse is, what are corpses in a position to do? You guys, you could go exhort a corpse all you want. To say, hey, can you go help that lady across the street, corpse? Uh, can you go to the store and buy me some groceries? Can you go work at the food kitchen, corpse? And what's the corpse going to do? <laughs> Why? Because it's dead. That's how we are. And so do you see how I took Christ's death and resurrection as a hermeneutical key or as a tool with which to look at the words of Jesus where he says, uh, do unto others as you have them do unto you. Here's how you do it. The fact is, that Jesus Christ did unto others even opposite of what they were doing unto him. 
There, see how you interpret it? Look at, he took the blows, he took the insults. He, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. He, he loved when he was getting no love initially or even back at all. He's the one who does unto others. And because through his love and because he saved me and pulled me out of the pit and gave me life where there was no life, gave me light where there was no darkness, gave me hope when I was hopeless, gave me peace when I was in despair, out of sheer joy of what he's done, I'm going to love those that he loves because of what he's done, not because it's a commandment that I have to fulfill in order to get heavenly points. That's different. That's the language of love instead of the language of obligation. The old covenant is the language of obligation. You better, you ought, you should. (laughs) <laughs> or else you're not God's people. Here's Jesus. You can, you may do it because you're already God's people through the blood of my son. Guys, that's just a, that's such a different motivation. Here, uh, Tim Keller. Um, uh, he says, uh, what did he say? We do not obey in order to get accepted. We're accepted and now we get to obey. It's beautiful. Martin Luther. Here's Luther. Sinners are attractive to God because they're loved. They're not loved by him because they're attractive. They're attractive because they're loved. They have the blood of Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus covering them, and God loves them. They're not loved because we're so attractive. Why? Guys, you could put lipstick on a pig. You could, you could, you could hussy up this corpse as much as you want, and you open that casket on the funeral day, and it's still an ugly, gross, scary-ass corpse. And that's all, that's all you're doing is putting lipstick on a course, corpse if you think you could do anything that generates salvation. It's all on his, his side of the ledger. And Jesus Christ loves, he's, he's one who's in the business of taking dead things and making them alive again. That Ezekiel 37, when, he, when God says to Ezekiel, prophesy to these dry bones. Huh? That's Jesus Christ. Because he says, calls Ezekiel son of man. And who's the ultimate, ultimate one who speaks to dry corpses and puts sinews and flesh and breath in them? Oh, it's the one who's the source of it all. The one who, the one who lost his life so that we have life. He's, he's the true Ezekiel. You see, Christ is the midpoint of everything. Christ is the true, true Abraham. What did Abraham do? He set off, not knowing whither he was going. Who's the ultimate one who left heaven, left everything, Right? He, what does Paul say about Jesus? He who was rich became poor, lost everything. Who's the ultimate one who set off not knowing where he was going into the dark? Jesus Christ. He's the true Abraham, huh? Amen. You know, he's the, he, he's, he's the true Jacob, right? He's the, he's the true Jacob, the, 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 the ultimate one who gives us blessing rather than one who's clamoring after it. It's Jacob. He's the true stairway to, or ramp to heaven that Jacob sees at Bethel. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus even says that about himself. John 1, he says, you'll see greater things than these. You'll see the Son of Man ascending and the angels of God ascending and descending on me. He says, that's directly back to Genesis and Jacob's dream at Bethel. See, that's a Christological interpretation. If you don't interpret the Bible Christologically like that as your first step, you're going to get everything wrong. You don't have a chance. Not even one chance, (laughs) no pun intended, in hell. You have no chance to get this right if you don't have a Christological lens to look at all the Bible. So wherever you open, it's a Christological lens. Look at, he's the true David. He's the real king. He's the real king who slayed the true Goliath, which are the powers of darkness, sin, and the devil. He slayed them all. We're not David slaying Goliath. Jesus Christ was slaying the true Goliath, right? He's the true Moses. It's his blood that goes on the doorpost. He's the true lamb of God. There you go. He's the one that leads his people out of slavery of sin and into the promised land of God's loving arms. It's Jesus. That's how you, I'm telling you, if you don't have that first step, don't even open it because you're going to be wrong at every other step. It's like if you're, if you're plotting to sail from London to New York, if you don't have your trajectory right, At the very outset, right right at the beginning, you could be thousands of miles off in the wrong direction. And this is why people screw up when they say, when they take a Bible passage out of context and the Bible says this and the Bible says this. And by the way, don't ever say the Bible says. I say that, but maybe I'd like to rather say the Apostle Paul said this, Gospel of Mark said this, the Psalms say this, right? Be precise, be precise with it. It's much more winsome and, and attractive. Okay. 
Uh, we're going to come back to this, so hang on to this. Don't make me make copies. Don't be lazy. Bring these back next week. Don't be, okay? Any, uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Father. We love you. I pray your blessing on us in this uh, dark January night. We thank you, like Lord, as, as Mike said, by the end of our class, we're going to be walking into greater and greater and greater light, not only in our lives with your word, because your word, you said your word is a lamp unto our path, a light for our feet and a lamp unto our path. And we thank you, Lord, that in the weeks ahead, <laughs> our physical environment is just going to get lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the true light of the world. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right. Thank you.